Well, good morning once again. My name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here at the church, and I'm just so honored to be able to be up here to uh, give you the sermon this morning. And so I want to start by telling you a little bit of a self-deprecating story. Uh, I am not one to shy away from making fun of myself because, as the youth know, there's a lot of things that I've done that are pretty dumb, okay? And here's an example, all right? So I have never been one to be really an actor, in fact, I would even say I'm a pretty terrible actor. I'm not good at it. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to commit to parts. And here's an example. When I was in college, we had to do a project, uh, Bible college. I had to do a, we had to do this obscure Bible story and we had to make a movie out of it. And so my character was simply like the final, almost like the final boss, the last person that had to be defeated so that the main character would be victorious. Okay. And while I'm fighting this guy, you know, like I have to have a death scene and so I get stabbed and we did the camera angle just right, the broomstick through here and held it down. I was like, ugh, you know, from over here, they can't see what's happening, right? And pr what proceeds from that moment is what my friends started to call for years afterwards and remind me of it constantly was what they called the 10 minute death scene. <laughs> because this is what I did. I got the stab and then I went, ugh. Uh, it staggered back and oh so gently just fell to the ground. I didn't want to fall backwards. I don't like pain. I don't want to fall and get myself hurt. So I just, I took my time falling to the ground. And it's because I'm not that type of person. I'm not an actor. I'm not committed to go forth with this. And it's also like, I didn't know quite how to do that. I don't know how to commit to a part to play, to play this role that I was supposed to play. And I think this relates for us as Christians because there are roles that we have been called to play as followers of Christ. And I think a lot of times what happens is people don't know that this is their role. They don't know that this is what they're supposed to do. They don't know how to do it. And so what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about how to play this role, how to play our part and do exactly what we're supposed to do. And the main thing we are to do, our, our main role that we are to play is to try and be distinct from the rest of the world and look completely different than the rest of the world because of the fact that we follow Christ. And we do this in the family of God as a church, that when we put our faith in Christ, we become part of this family that now seeks the better of each other and says, we want to see each other do better. We want to see each other grow. We want to see each other become who God has called us to be and to be distinct, to be completely different. Because this, this place, when we meet together, when we are together, and truly, no matter where we are as the church, it is to be something that is totally different from the rest of the world. And so, here's our main thing we're going to look at this morning is that the church, for the church to have healthy relationships as a family of God, we must be calling each other to a higher standard to live distinct lives from the rest of the world because of our faith in the gospel. And so we're going to ask those questions. What does that look like? How, how do we do that? What does that look like in every single day life in different areas? How do we do this in a way that, and we do it well, and as well as Christians, how do we respectfully confront each other and come to each other and say, hey, we, this is something that needs to be worked on. We love you and do this in a way that is honoring before God. And so today we're going to consider four attributes, four attributes that should make us distinct as the family of God from the world around us. So I invite you to go ahead and turn to the book of Titus. We'll be in chapter two. If you do not have a Bible, go ahead and use, there's a brown hardcover back Bible in the seat in front of you and turn to page 1200. So you can be with us and you can see it. I'll have it on the screen, but you can also see that it's in your Bible and I'm not just making this stuff up. You know, and so let me just give you some background on the book of Titus. Titus is this very short letter that was written by the apostle Paul to one of his disciples named Titus, hence the name of the letter. And Titus was commissioned by Paul to be a pastor on this island called Crete. Now, take a look at how beautiful Crete is. Like, let's just be honest, suffering for Jesus right there. Okay, he is suffering in this beautiful place. It is set in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. All right, just this beautiful location. But the people of Crete had this notorious reputation for kind of being awful. Okay, first of all, the Greeks had a word for, one of their words for lying was this word, kretizo, which literally means to be a Cretan, and they used it to talk about being a liar. So they equated Cretans with being liars and being treacherous. 
like that's, I don't know if I want anybody to have that reputation whatsoever, any group of people, okay? And so they also had this reputation for having a very open and free lifestyle that you could have as many partners outside of your marriage as you want. You can drink to your heart's content. You can party as much as you want. Just live this life. Take on the pleasures that are available to you and just enjoy the things that have been given to you. And then what was starting to happen and why Paul wrote this letter was that there were these teachers coming in and telling people on Crete, hey, you can be a believer in Christ and you can do this. You got the best of both worlds. You're forgiven and you get to go and do whatever you want. And Paul's coming in and saying to Titus, you remind them that's wrong. Stand up, don't, don't hesitate to tell them, rebuke them, call them out and get those people out of here. And so this is why, one of the reasons why we need to do this as a family of God is because there are going to be influences. There's going to be people coming in. They're going to try and tell us, you know, from the outside of how we ought to live. And we need to say, no, this is what God has called us to do. This is how we want to live. And we need to be totally distinct from the rest of the world. So let's begin, start and just look at verse one. That's kind of the foundation verse of this passage. And so let's start verse one. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. So the you is Titus. He's speaking directly to Titus. And he says, you, however, and what you do is you go back to what Paul has just talked about. And what Paul has just talked about is he's talking about the nature and the character of these false teachers that have come in telling the Crete Christians that they can follow Christ and do whatever they want. And what he's saying is you look at their... You look at their lives and you see, and he literally says they are, their minds and their consciences are corrupted. They're corrupted by sin. They're corrupted by evil. They are not from God. And so you, instead of teaching what they teach, what you need to teach is something that is appropriate to sound doctrine. And to put this literally, it means what is fitting to healthy belief. In other words, this is a statement of Paul saying, what you say about God, what you believe about God, what we would call the word theology, needs to match up with the way that you live, what we would say ethics, your morality. That when we look at our lives, we need to be able to say, my theology, what I believe about God, matches up with the way that I live. That there would be no difference, that there would be, they would be the same, they would fit together instead of being disjointed. Because at times, a lot of times what people would do is, as when we do this, we separate the two. And so Paul is telling Titus, this is instead what you need to teach. And there's just been this, I, and I even noticed this when I was in Bible college, that there has become, become kind of a movement of a distrust of theological concepts of like knowing our faith really well, that it's like, oh, well, that, that doesn't let you be available to have a, a more free and vibrant and joyful relationship with God if you just know too much. It's actually not true. When you, the more you know, it should lead you to be more worshipful and be more excited about who God is. And as well, it should lead you to lead a more godly life. It should, it's one of those things that should automatically happen because when you start to have the right knowledge, it can lead to right thinking, which can lead to right behaviors, right choices. It's that you gotta follow through with that process. And so when we see that, when we see Paul say these things, he's reminding Titus, you've got to teach the right things, and you've also got to make sure you live your life, and we'll see that in a minute, and especially because of this island they were living on. They needed to be distinct in what they taught. They needed to live a life that matched up with what they taught, and so this is our first attribute is that we must call each other to have a worldview that is consistent with the teachings of Christ, which leads to a godly life. We need to be able to say, you know what, I'm not going to be one of those people that's going to say, well, if you know too much, then it, it doesn't allow you to have a really free relationship with God. Is that we call each other and when we have relationships with people, we do this within, you know, people that we know, not just some random person that we see, but we might, and we might say to them, hey, you know, that's not, the Bible doesn't say that. That's going to lead you down this path if you believe that. If you think that this is what it's going to do, this is dangerous for you to do. And so what we do is we need to say, I want to have correct understanding of these things. And so let me give you an example of why this is important. So say I have two friends, and one of them is named Bob, and I want to introduce Bob to my friend Phil, right? And I, and I come to Phil, and I say, hey, Phil, this is my friend Bob. 
He's a really cool guy. And then I start to describe all these things about Bob, but they are completely wrong and inaccurate. First of all, I don't think Bob's going to be super happy with me at that moment that I'm telling him all these, telling Phil all these things that are completely wrong about him. But I'm going to give off the wrong impression. I'm not going to pr accurately portray him, and I'm not, I'm not going to show that I actually know him. And so the beauty of what this is, is we, when we get to know Christ and we learn more and we understand more about what we believe as Christians, it can lead us to better accurately portray who Jesus is, what he has done, and as a result, like how this works out for other people, how this works out for them. So that's our first attribute. That's, we need to make that a huge thing. And as well, and make sure I say this, that Paul says in Galatians 1 that anyone that brings a different gospel to you, to the Galatians, he says, let them be accursed. So that's how serious Paul is about this kind of an idea that teach the right thing. Don't change what has already been revealed to us. Okay, let's move to verse 2. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. So these are the things, these different demographics that now Paul is going to address and he's going to want them. This is how this plays out with these different demographics. Starts with the older men. And he says to be temperate, worthy of respect, and self-controlled. That self-controlled word is going to show up several times throughout this passage. This is a key phrase and it literally means to have measured restraint in all things. And I don't know, I, I don't know about you, but this is not something that we're necessarily taught in our culture is to have measured restraint. We're kind of told, like in Crete, just go for it. Go for whatever you want. Go whatever you feel like you want to do. Enjoy the life that has been put in front of you and just, and, and with no consideration. But as Christians, we need to have a measured restraint, a cautiousness to it. When even they say, when Paul says this word temperate, it's, a ca it's about being cautious in the use of wine, in the use of alcohol. And then this worthy of respect phrase, it means something where you have this demeanor that is immediately respectable to the outside world. That people would look at them and say, yeah, I respect that man. I respect him. And so when you put these three together, this is something that to the extent where it says, these are virtues that describe a life of respectability that is free from overindulgence, dissipation, and foolishness. And so they want to have this respectable, distinct manner in the way that they live so that people say, hey, there's something, there's something different about them. And that they also would be sound in faith in what they believe in Christ. They're sound, they're solid in it. And then, so, and then as a result, because of that faith, they act out in love and sacrifice for other people. And then in endurance to stand firm in the midst of adversity and to continue to believe. So that's what it is for older men. Then he goes to the, the older women. He says, likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live. When he says to be reverent in the way they live, what he's meaning is that the inward reality of what Christ has done in their hearts would then come out in their behavior and how they live. Because here's something we have to understand about women in particular on the island of Crete. There was this idea, this new philosophy that had come out around this time that was about the new woman and that she was liberated to go and freely experience the world as she wanted to outside of her marriage so she could have as many sexual partners as she wanted, not be faithful to her husband. She could go to parties. She could just enjoy herself and abandon the home. And so when you see this phrase, he's telling, he's telling these older women, don't be like that. Let the inward reality of your belief come out in the way that you act, that you act in a reverent manner and that you don't drink too much because when he says don't be slanderous, because this happens for everybody. When, there, when there's been too much alcohol, the, lo the lips get a little loose, right? Things start to be said. So be very careful. But instead, he says to teach what is good, which literally means to be good teachers. That they would be a living model to the younger women about what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. And then... He says, then you can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children. Then you can do these things. Now, the list he, he gives here are these actual seven attributes that were listed like the ideal, respectable wife of that culture. These seven things. 
loving, husbands, uh, loving their husbands and their children, to be self-controlled, to be pure, meaning to stay faithful to their husband, to be busy at home. That doesn't mean barefoot and pregnant and stuck in the kitchen. What that means is not abandoning your home for the sake of your own pleasures, that you make sure that your home is taken care of, okay? That's what it means to make sure you take care of your home. And then to be kind and to be subject to their husbands, not a dominating subject like man says, I am the ruler of this home and you will do what I say no matter what, you can't question it. That's not biblical marriage. That's not a biblical relationship. A biblical relationship is like in Ephesians 5 where Paul says that the husbands must love the wives as Christ has loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave his life for it. So men, you got to be willing to die and give your life for your wives. And then Paul says, wives, be in submission to your husbands. You see a little bit of mutuality there. You see this interplay where men lay down their lives. And so that's biblical marriage. And anything outside of that, if a man starts to try and control a home because he says, you ought to submit to me, I'm just going to tell you right now that is spiritual abuse and that's wrong. That's sin. That is not the way that God designed it to be. But the reason that these women would act in this way, look at this phrase, so that they will not, so that no one will malign the word of God. So that, again, their behavior, their theology, what they believe about God would match up with their ethics and what they, how they act. And then as a result, people can't go, yeah, you see that? You see that? That's hypocritical. They say to not do that, but yet they do do that. And you know what? That means this isn't true. And this is a common thread throughout this passage. See it again when we get to verse 6. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. There's that word again. In everything, set, that, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. So he says, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. Don't let them go into what standard uh, that they can be young men and go and enjoy the pleasures of life as they feel free to do so. Instead, he says, in everything, set them an example. So Titus was to be the model of what it looked like to be a follower of Christ to these young men. He was to be one that said, I'm going to show you what this looks like. And then as a result... He's going to do what is good, and as a result, in his teaching, he's also going to show integrity, meaning the thing, everything fits. He's got the right motives. He's got the right teaching. It all fits together. His seriousness, he senses the gravity of what he's doing and why he's there, his, the purpose of his life, and then the soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that he's speaking things to where they would not be able to find any room to accuse him and say, hey, Titus, I, I saw you doing this thing. This doesn't match up with what you teach. He's saying, don't do that so that basically they can say nothing bad about you. Don't get caught up in that. And so what you see, you see this common thread throughout this little section here, that it's about seeing the older generation, the mature generation, and that doesn't necessarily have to mean uh, older by age, but older by spiritual maturity, stepping up to the plate and saying, I'm going to disciple these younger generations to make sure that they know what it means to follow Christ. First of all, because it's something we're commanded to do, but second of all, so that the gospel message won't be hindered. And so this is our second attribute is that we must be passionate about discipling new and younger believers to grow in Christ so that the gospel message won't be hindered. This is something we have to be passionate about, desiring. Every single person says, I'm involved in this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to step up. And if you are a person that says, man, I need to be discipled before I can disciple someone, that's a good place to be in. That's a good place to be in, and we want to provide that. We want to see people be discipled in this church that want it. But let me give you an example of how this works out. When I was in high school, I had this very tight group of friends in my, high, in my youth group, and we all went to the same high school. And we all were passionate about following Jesus, wanting to show love to our friends, and a few people that we knew came to know Christ. Uh, but one of the hurdles that we had to get over was that there was a large contingency of uh, people in our school that would call themselves Christians, but we knew exactly what they were doing on the weekends. And they were partying and they were sleeping around just like the major what we felt like was the majority of people in our school. And so we knew that our, the message that we were preaching was being hindered because it was difficult because people were saying, ah, look, they're, we're off doing, they're off doing that, but they go to church and everything's fine, they, they're okay. 
So that was a hurdle that we had to get through. So we needed to, this is something as Christians we must realize, is that we cannot sit here and just say, you know what, I don't need my life to, my beliefs to match up with the way that I live. It's simply not true. They need to match up so that people can't look at us and say, ah, oh, there it is, there's the thing. There's the thing, I found it. That disproves that Christianity is real because of how they live, because of what they do. And, and no matter what stage of life you're in, no matter where you're at, you can be involved in this. You can be involved in it, even if you feel like that you are towards, you know, like you've passed, you've retired and you feel like you've passed usefulness. No, you haven't. God can still use you in incredibly powerful ways with your wisdom, with your experience, and with your knowledge. Okay, let's continue. Verse 9. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. So we have to understand this concept. Like the, Slavery in the Bible still had this kind of viewing people as, owner, as, as property kind of thing, this ownership kind of thing. It's, um, you know, not on the whole, uh, there were different cases where slavery was different, but not on the whole like where we have with the slave trade in our country, where people were being bought, you know, shipped across the ocean and sold as property. It was an awful, horrible thing. Sometimes people come at this passage or other passages and say, hey, they look, Bible justifies slavery. That means it's not true. That's not what Paul's doing here. He's actually trying not to make a statement about whether or not slavery is right. He's actually trying to say, slaves, if you are in the middle of this, this is how you live as a follower of Christ. And what he's pointing them to is actually something a little bit more subtle and a little bit more subversive. Basically, that they would be the best at what they do so that their masters would trust them and say, wow, there's something different about this person. Like he says, the say, that this makes God attractive. Like the word is literally to be beautifully adorned. And so that they look at it and they say, wow, there's something different. They're in this difficult spot. They're in slavery. And yet here they are being these extremely hard workers. They're not stealing from me. I can trust them with just about anything. They don't talk back to me. I trust this person. And so as a result, they were to reveal Christ in that way. And so where this works out for us as followers of Christ today is, you know, if you are in somebody, uh, under somebody else's authority, uh, whether you are an employee, whether you are a student, whether you are simply just trying to be a law-abiding citizen in our country, no matter what that is, that we would say, I'm going to elevate my game and I'm going to step up to work the hardest out of anybody. I, I, I truly believe this. Christians who are employees of businesses should be the hardest workers at those spots, should be the most trustworthy. Christians as students should be the most trustworthy and hardworking to show that this is who Jesus is. This is what he has called me to do because the point is so that people would come to know Christ. It's not just to get a paycheck. It's not just to get a degree, but it's so that people will know who Jesus is and come to a relationship with him. And so this is our third attribute, that we must call each other to be examples of Christ wherever we go, especially in our workplace. Being the example of Christ is Christ being the ultimate, you know, showing of how to submit to God's will that God said, die on the cross. And Jesus said, I'll do it. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And Jesus is our ultimate example. And so this is what we do now. And so as Christians, we say, I'm going to be the hardest worker in my business that I work at. I'm going to be the hardest working student in my class. And I'm going to be, I'm going to show my teacher grace and compassion. I'm not going to talk back. I'm going to be a good example. And I'm just, moment of confession. I don't think I did this very well as a high schooler. I really don't think I did. I didn't understand this. And I regret it. I regret it deeply, uh, this one particular scenario. I had this teacher, my, ang my junior English teacher, who uh, it was, I'm pretty certain it was her first year. And so we had a block schedule. So that meant, you know, every other day we'd have her class, right? So we came in on Monday and she said, okay, we've got a test this week. So you're going to come in on Wednesday. You're gonna we're going to study for it together as a class. And then Friday, we're going to take the test. And I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up when I tell you this. We came in Wednesday and she said, I changed my mind. We're going to take the test today. 
Oh boy. So except for the two overachievers in the class who were like, you know, beyond straight A students, we all failed. Bad. And I'm not, I, I'm a, you know, I've been a good student. I'm not one to fail. And I failed because I, I was notorious for late minute, last minute uh, studying. So, and we were livid as a class. But instead of going against the grain and continuing to show kindness to a, to a person who had really messed up something big in my life. Rather than that, I went with the tide and was unkind. And I would do things that really would reveal, oh, this, so this is what a Christian is like. This was a woman who was already pretty angry about Christianity to begin with. And so I don't think I helped. In any, way, in any way, shape, or form. And that's what we need to do. We need to say, man, I need to step up to the plate and say, I want to make Jesus attractive in the way that I am a student, the way that I am a worker, the way that I am out in public. I want to just represent Christ wherever I go. Let's continue. Look at verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this is his theological backing for the reason he's done all of this. Because the grace of God has appeared in the person of Jesus to bring salvation that is available to all people. The reason we act in this way is because we want to see all people come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That we wouldn't see any person as outside the possibility of being saved by Jesus. Paul is our ultimate example how that is just simply not true. That there is no one outside that possibility. Because Paul was chasing people down, chasing Christians down to murder them, have them killed because he didn't like what they believed. And yet, while on one of those journeys, God put him on his back and said, you're going to be one of mine. You're going to be one of my people. And so this has been made available. This is the reason that we do all of this, because we want to see as many people as possible come to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. doesn't matter if they have, you know, they have not been the most exemplary bosses or people in the world. We're going to, we're, we want to see them saved. But then he says, this grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Remember, he's referring to the way that they, what they were surrounded by on the island of Crete. So we're being taught to say no to these things. That the grace of God teaches us to do it. It just doesn't just leave us to figure it out. It's like, okay, you're forgiven. Have fun. Figure it out. But that it teaches us how to say no. And that God's will for us is, look at this, to live there's the word again, self-controlled, upright, godly, and godly lives in this present age. Sometimes we might even get stuck to the point where we start to say, man, I am stuck in this. I'm never going to get out. I'm never going to stop. I can't get out of this because this world is too broken. This world is too messed up and sin-filled. I can't stop this. But God's will for our lives is that we would stop, that we would move on from these things. That God wants to teach us how to do this in the middle of this present age while we wait for Jesus to come back. We're all sitting here waiting and anxious for Jesus to return so that, you know, we're done. I love that Micah chose the song, I'll Fly Away. It's an oldie, but a, but a goodie. I love that song. But that we're sitting here waiting. We're waiting for Jesus to return, and yet God has given us the power to be able to walk away and to live these godly lives. Look at what he says next, verse 14. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. And so this Jesus gave himself for us and his, one of his purposes to redeem us. So Jesus gave of his life for us in order to redeem us. And let me just tell you about redeem because this word is one of my favorites in the Bible. What this word redeem means is literally to take out of slavery and into something great, into freedom, okay? And that the greatest example of that in the Bible is God taking Israel from their slavery in Egypt and saying, I'm going to free you. I'm going to set you free, take you out, pay the ransom price so that you can go spend time with me in, re in my rest in my promised land. 
And so for us as Christians, where this becomes is that God wants to rescue and redeem us, take us out of our slavery of sin and wickedness and pull us out into a new life with him. What a beautiful thing. And it's not just, you know, there's these things, this idea of forgiveness. Our sins are forgiven. They're canceled. It's, it's done with. They're not on our record anymore. But there's also this beautiful idea, what he says next, to purify for himself a people that are his very own. That what God wants to do is he wants to take us out of our wickedness into his kingdom to set us free from those things so that those things don't hold us back anymore, so that we're not struggling with them anymore, so that we move on and into this new redeemed life that Christ has made available for us, but also that he would just completely wash us clean. That the dirtiness and the shame and the guilt that we feel from those things in our past would be washed completely clean and gone absolutely gone. And then as a result that this, we would be purified and become a people of God's very own possession. That God, God takes us into his family, that, we, that we become, he's our father, he takes us in. We are his children. We are his very own. And then look at that we would become eager to do what is good. Not just now able to do it, but eager saying, you know what, now I want to live my life for Jesus. I want to follow him. I want to do what he has called me to do because I have been set free from these things. Now my whole life has been changed so that I will go do these things. And so if you're a person, and I've been here before, where you feel like you can't say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, let me just give you hope. God it's God's will that you can say no. And there's a few ways that you can work on it to do that. First of all, you got to confess it. You've got to admit, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know how to stop. And you ask God, you say, God, I need your help. God, would you help me? Would you redeem me? Would you do this work? Would you make this happen? Second, you find somebody in your life that you can talk to and, and ask for their help, ask for their guidance, ask for their love, their friendship to help you get through this. That's why we are a family because we, we need to help each other. We, can't, we were not made to do this alone. We were, this is not what we were made for. We were made to be in community with people who are loving us and helping us to grow and to move on from these things. And then as well that we need, lastly what you could do is you could try and dig in into your heart and find the areas of why you do those things and you can break those down. And you could and get Jesus into those areas of your life that you have felt and, and heal those hurts and pains that you didn't want to deal with. And that cuts off, I'm telling you, that cuts off the power of sin in your life because now what has held you back, you have given to Jesus, he's healed you of, and so then those things become uninteresting and unappealing because you know where they lead. And so this is, and, and, and mostly we want to ask, we want to ask God. And so this is what we must do. This is our fourth attribute, is we must remind each other that the gospel saves us from ungodly lives and brings us into a new redeemed life in Christ. We have such a strong tendency to, to focus simply on the idea of going to heaven someday that we forget that Jesus wants to bring about a new redeemed life right here, right now on this earth while we wait for Jesus to return. This is something that God wants to do for every single person. And let me just tell you, if you feel like you might be sitting there saying, you know, not my story. That's not going to happen for me. You don't know where I've been. I don't know specifically where you've been, but I have seen people across all different types of struggles, addictions, pains, sorrows. I've seen them be healed. I've seen people walk away from drug and alcohol addictions. I've seen people walk away from pornography and sex addictions. I've seen people truly who were at the moment about to sign divorce papers say, no, I'm gonna fi I, wa I wanna fix this instead. Go back and, f and their marriage gets healed. And I've seen God, when it does end up going to divorce, I've seen God heal those people's hearts. I've seen God do work in people's lives that is incredible. And this is what God wants to do for you. And what really it comes down to is you saying, Jesus, I can't do it. I need you to do it. I need you to heal me. And so then Titus is, is told, verse 15, to these are the things he should teach. It's a bookend with verse 1. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. So go ahead, teach these things. 
Encourage people with the, these people with these ideas. Also rebuke those false teachers and tell, because you have the authority that Christ gave me, I now give you to do. And then he says, do not let anyone despise you. He's saying, don't be intimidated. Don't back down. Don't be scared. And so here's the thing that we need to remember. We are a family. We are a body of Christ that has been brought together by the blood of Jesus so that we can encourage and love one another, remind each other of these things. And so that's what we need to, to do. And so this morning, let's take a moment and just think about areas where we say, you know what, this is where I'm having trouble saying no to ungodliness. This is where I need work. I don't know how to stop this. Take a moment to recognize that. And then take a moment as well where you have kind of excused uh, behaviors in your life where you're say, and, and where you're not trying to resemble Jesus with the way that you live. Take a moment to say, man, uh, Jesus, where, where are there areas where I have given in and allowed myself to resemble more the world than I have you? Because I think truly, if we're honest with ourselves, it is much easier to go with the tide, to go with the flow, to go where we have been told, where this is, this is okay, to go with where everybody else is going. And it's much more difficult to say, I'm going to go against the tide. I'm going to go where it's harder. I'm going to fight against this. Be who God has called me to be. But let me tell you, this is the plan, this is the desire for God for you to go this way, but this is also a path that he has enabled you to go because of the Holy Spirit and dwelling in you and that new redeemed life. And you are not alone. We are here to do this together. And so let's remember what we said at the beginning. For the church to be healthy as a family of God, we must be calling each other to a higher standard to live distinct lives from the rest of the world because of the gospel. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what you have done for us and how you have redeemed us and done some incredible work in our lives, God, that we simply could not have done without you. And so Jesus, we pray this morning that we would truly offer ourselves completely to you and that you would be the one who works in our lives and to bring these about, and that we would be a family who lovingly and graciously and compassionately calls each other to live to a higher standard. Because God, that's what you want for us. But God, we can't do it alone. We need you and we need each other. So God, thank you for this morning. We pray this all in your name. Amen.